back in the 60s. And I used to get criticized by, you know, Sam Maloof and Wharton Eshrick particularly, and George Nakashima would, all, would criticize me because of my use too much wood. That, you know, I'm, in laminating you use lots of wood. And that I didn't really respect wood. And I, but I respected it in a different way. I mean, I appreciate wood on a, in a different way. I appreciate it because it's a, a wonderful material to build with. And the, having a fancy grain isn't necessary. Sometimes it's fine, nothing wrong with it, but you don't have to have it because the form is what I really want people to see. Uh, may I tell a story? Um, when I was young, I mean like 12, 14, 15, I don't know the exact age, and I, but it would be about around 1945 or 46, uh, my father uh, subscribed to a little magazine called Delta Craft. It was like cheap, like 10 cents for a copy. And what that was is a little handyman kind of thing and gave you projects to make and gave you the plans and all you needed to know to make this shelf or this birdhouse. Or, and in one of those magazines in, uh, I believe it was 46, uh, there was an article on how to make a duck decoy. And what it showed was the cross sections of the body of the duck and the head um, and gave you the plans so you could cut out with your little coping saw or jigsaw if you had one and glue these all together and you'd have this stair step thing just like we do and you'd take a rasp and knock off the stair steps and get yourself a duck decoy. I thought that was really cool. But I never made a duck decoy. I had no reason to want a duck decoy. We didn't really have a workshop that capable of doing that. We had a few tools, but not, not enough to do that. Then when I was in college, many years later, I was studying sculpture, there was an article in one of the art magazines uh, about a sculptor uh, and how he went about his work. And he, he was a carver. And he would go to a millwork company and get them to glue up, I think usually out of mahogany, okay. this big block of wood. So it'd be like three foot square and eight foot high rectangle of wood. And they'd go to, go to work carving. And when I saw that article and read that article, which I thought was pretty interesting, I thought, then I remembered the duck decoy and I thought, he could have saved a ton of wood and a ton of time if he'd have planned each cross section. So I thought, well, I'll do that. I'll not glue up a rectangle of wood and start to carve. I will plan the cross sections so that the cross section through it at any given point is approximately correct. Well, you know, I, um, I have all through my career given myself myself, what might be considered a goal, that I want, to, I want to have this level happen and it will fulfill a certain thought I had. And I can remember one of the early goals I had was I kept, kept thinking a lot about how would you know, how would I know, if my work was uh, being appreciated uh, collected, exhibited, so on. How would I know if it was being appreciated the same as sculpture? And I thought, well, one thing that you can actually measure is how many dollars. Those other things are not measurable, uh, but dollars are measurable. Today, you ain't got the dough, Ray Me. You ain't got the dough, Ray Me. You better 
I mean, risk-taking is what it's all about, all the way. I mean, if you just, I mean, I have those, you, you saw those rules of thumb uh, on the wall down there. The last one was, if you hit the bullseye every time, the target is too near. You got to keep moving that target out there. And the more, you, the further you move it out, the more risk there is. But risk is what it's all about. And I think that risk plays such an important part. I mean, I, in, my, in my own mind, I have often likened it to a race car driver. I mean, if you're a race car driver and you're playing it safe, you're not going to win. You have to take risks to win. And I'm in this ex extremely fortunate position of having had the resilience to be around all this time and have learned uh, so much about how, how I work, how I might work, how I do work, and I've learned enough about how galleries work uh, and all those things. And I'm in the u unique position that all these things are kind of coming together at the right time, in a sense. It would have been nice earlier, of course. Maybe success and loneliness go together. It's probably not a subject I've really even ever talked about. But I'm aware that it's there. But as I keep saying, it does not interfere. I think that a lot of things have to align for you to get what you really want out of the field, and pretty obvious what I want, I want to do well.
It is my distinct pleasure to introduce an artist, sculptor, designer, and an educator who's been pushing boundaries and inspiring us all for over 50 years. He's also the 2001 Furniture Society Award of Distinction honoree. He has many other accolades. Um, and feel free to read his bio in the program. Um, please welcome Wendell Castle. Good morning. I am a man of questions. I ask questions of my work. I ask questions of myself, such as, how is it that I am standing up here this morning? When I graduated from high school, I might very likely have been considered the least likely to succeed. I was not the best student in my art classes at the University of Kansas. I did very well, but there were others who seemed more talented. Yet I am the only student, the only art student, from the University of Kansas to receive an honorary doctorate from the University of Kansas. How is it that something like that can happen? Where are all the others who seem more talented than I? I'm not sure I really know. I do, however, have some thoughts on the subject. Recently, my Paris gallery asked me to suggest a name for my up-and-coming exhibit. After some thought, I decided on a leap of faith, which I realized was exactly what I've been doing my whole career. I must have been crazy to think that furniture could take me so far. So this morning's presentation is entitled, A Leap of Faith. I have often thought about the randomness of the cosmos. My life has been a series of random events. Chance events play a much larger role in life than most of us think. Randomness often plays out in very subtle ways. In the world of art, most career trajectories entail a complex sequence of steps each of which depends upon those that preceded it. If any of those earlier steps had been different, our entire career path would almost surely have been different too. Some of those initial steps will be influenced by seemingly trivial random events, but randomness will at times place us in some very fortunate time-space convergence, which is clearly important, but more important yet is to recognize that importance, and even more important yet is to know what to do about it. Somehow, I realized that by combining furniture and sculpture, a new art form could be created. There are four things that I would like to speak about this morning. Art, creativity, critical thinking, and technology. First of all, I would like to define creativity. I believe creativity can be simply defined as doing something for the first time that is valued by others. A true artist or designer is someone who does something for the first time something human, something that touches others. It's not art if the world 
or at least some little part of it, does, is not transformed in some way. Most of all, it's not art if there is no risk. It's not the risk of financial ruin, although I suppose it could be. It's the risk of rejection and failure. Art requires the artist to care and to care enough to do something even when we suspect it might not work. Art, like life itself, is a voyage of discovery. I had to lay one brick on another, set thousands of ideas on paper before getting one authentic one dragged up from my gut. I haven't the slightest idea what my future work will look like. My drawings and models are the slenderest of help. I may scrap them all. I invent, distort, deform, inflate, exaggerate, compound, and confuse as I see fit. I obey only my own instincts, which often I do not understand. I often draw things I do not understand, but secure in the knowledge that they may at some point become clear and meaningful. I have faith in myself. I have had to learn to think, feel, see in my own way, which is the hardest thing in the world. Whatever progress there is in art comes not from adaptation, but from daring. Having grown up in Kansas, I was profoundly affected by the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. But even more worrisome was the fact that I am dyslexic. My early years in school were extremely difficult. As no one had yet recognized that condition, I received no help. I think people just thought I was stupid. I was not good at anything. I was a failed academic, a failed athlete, a failed musician. The only thing I was good at was daydreaming, and that was not valued. I believe it was Einstein that said, everyone, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. Being dyslexic may be helpful in thinking of things in ways that are different from how everyone else thinks about things. Picasso was likely dyslexic. He had no trouble thinking about things in a different way. When asked by a gentleman at an opening of his work, uh, the gentleman asked, why don't you paint women the way they really look? And Picasso said, how do they look? And the questioning gentleman pulled out his wallet showed Picasso a picture of his wife. And Picasso replied, she's very small, isn't she? <laughs> and flat, too. I now know that artists are much more likely than the general public to be dyslexic. Many artists credits, the, credits their dyslexia with giving them an edge. It's not that there is a secret code that only dyslexics can read. No, it's because our outsider tendencies make it clear at some point that we will be less likely to cho be chosen for almost any job. Price, precisely because we have little choice, we must choose ourselves. However, it's impossible to choose yourself if you don't know how the system works. It's impossible to choose yourself if you don't speak the language. It's impossible to choose yourself if you're in a game 
that you cannot win. We are also less likely to make safe and practical decisions. There's a big, big problem with making sensible decisions. It's that so does everyone else. I find no reason to be sensible, practical, or reasonable. In fact, my work of the last 10 years is more likely to be considered anti-design as it does not adhere to the design norms. I live an impractical life. I dress impractically. I drive impractical cars. I make impractical furniture. I have no interest in being practical. I believe this kind of lifestyle is conductive to creativity. And one more thing about living a creative life. Have a hidden passion, something outside your work that you are passionate about. Play a musical instrument, ballroom dance, play a sport, whatever. It will increase your creative abilities. I believe in going where there is no path and leaving a trail. Everything we know, we must leave for others. We should have no secrets. Share everything you know. If you think for a moment your secret formula for a finish or your secret way of sharpening or whatever will set you apart, then you don't have much going for you. For me, the reason that creativity is so exciting that when I am involved in it, I feel I am living more fully than in other parts of my life. The excitement of the work in the studio comes close to the ideal fulfillment that we all want to get from life. Creativity also leaves an outcome which adds to the richness, complexity of our universal experience. I believe it's best to be an outsider. We can continue to innovate our entire lives so long as we maintain the perspective of an outsider. We need to be willing to leave behind the safety of our expertise. The outsider problem affects everyone. Although we live in a world that worships insiders, such experience takes a toll on creativity. To spend a great deal of time at anything is to become too familiar with it. I must constantly try to forget what I already know. I had to learn to think in new ways, in an uneducated way, my own way, which is not easy. I had to throw myself into the current, knowing I may well sink. The great majority of artists are throwing themselves into the current with life preservers, preservers around their necks. And more often than not, it's the life preserver that sinks them. Whatever progress there is in life comes not through adaptation, but through daring. It's easy to become numb to the possibilities of something new. The only way to remain creative over time is to not be undone by our expertise and to experiment with ignorance. We tend to see the most when we are on the outside looking in. There is always more than one way to look at any given thing. Idea thinking may simply mean the realization that there is no particular virtue in doing things the way they have always been done. The greatest danger is, become, is becoming a prisoner of familiarity. The more often we do anything in the same way, the more difficult it is to think of it in other ways. Remember, what things look like is a convention, not a truth. I heard this story recently about a little girl in her drawing class. And her teacher 
was looking over her shoulder and asked her, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but no one knows what God looks like. The little girl said, they will in a minute. <laughs> Art has always been a form of redemption, a transfiguration of the commonplace. The very act of turning something into an image alters and aggrandizes it. Great art can be made out of ordinary ideas that have been transformed into something quite extraordinary. Art is omnivorous. It appropriates, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to be serious. <laughs> anyway, art is omnivorous. It appropriates all forms and assimilates all materials. The result should be a kind of paradox. The ability to hold together the tensions of opposites, embrace uncertainty and ambiguity. These are critical characteristics of contemporary art. And remember, it is important to trust your intuition. Intuition is the unpredictable human element that saves us from the expected and helps to produce ideas which are surprises as well as solutions. Nothing in life is foolproof. The Titanic was supposed to be an unsinkable ship. Every 100% sure thing has an iceberg out there with your name on it. I believe the difference between being successful and unsuccessful, creatively speaking, may be simply our ability to alternate between emotional and rational thoughts, which forces us to consider how we are actually thinking. The author, Malcolm Gladwell, reminds us of a, of a story, uh, this, an ancient Greek ex expression, which is, the fox knows many things. I'm sorry, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. A hedgehog is a small animal covered with spines. When attacked, it rolls into a ball such that the spines stick outward. This is the hedgehog's only defense. The fox, on the other hand, doesn't rely on a single strategy when threatened. Instead, it adjusts its strategy to fit the particulars of the situation. A person who thinks like a hedgehog is prone to bouts of certainty, so he just keeps doing the same thing over and over and over again. A person who thinks like a hedgehog, and the other, I'm, I'm sorry, a person who thinks like a fox accepts ambiguity and takes an ad hoc approach to coming up with ideas. The fox gathers data from a wide variety of sources and ultimately makes better decisions. After all, almost everything is about making good decisions. Getting ideas is not the hard part. It's making good decisions about what idea to go with. The fox thinker is more like to study his own decision-making process. In other words, he thinks about how he thinks. Critical thinking is an important component of the creative process. I think it's important to evaluate evidence, to tell fact from opinion, to see holes in an argument, determine whether or not cause and effect have been established, and to spot illogic. Ideas are not precious. They are everywhere, which suggests 
that the extraordinary process we think of as creativity does not really depend upon genius, serendipity, epitome, or whatever. Hard work and determination are, in the end, the major ingredient. My background has taught me that sculpture is not a commodity or a product. I am des not designing for anyone but myself. All of the motivation is intrinsic, which is clearly conductive to creativity. Lucky for me, there was no extrinsic motivation early in my career, because I couldn't sell anything anyway. If you've read anything on the subject of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, you know that being offered a reward clobbers creativity. I try to make work that speaks to the authentic me, rather than to what is currently popular in the art world or why it might be saleable. In the Broadway play Red, <coughs> excuse me, in the Broadway play Red by John Hogan, there are just two characters, Mark Rothko, the painter, and Ken, his assistant. At one point in the play, Roth Ken asks Rothko if he ever got tired of telling people what art is. Rothko answered, no, not ever, until they listen. Ken said, you're just mad because the barbarians are at the gate. And what do you know? People like the barbarians. Rothko, of course they like them. That's the goddamn point. You know what people like? Happy, bright colors. They want things to be pretty. They want things to be beautiful. Jesus Christ, when someone tells me one of my pictures is beautiful, I want to vomit. Ken, not going, Ken says, what's wrong? And not going interrupts. Pretty, beautiful, nice, fine. That's our life now. Everything's fine. We put on a funny nose and glasses and slip on a banana peel, and the TV makes everything happy, and everyone's laughing all the time. It's all so goddamn funny. We're a smirking nation, living under the tyranny of fine. How are you? Fine. How was your day? Fine. How are you feeling? Fine. How do you like the painting? Fine. You want some dinner? Fine. Let me tell you, everything is not fine. Rothko continues. How are you? How was your day? How are you feeling? Conflicted, nuanced, troubled, diseased, doomed? I am not fine. We are not fine. We are anything but fine. Look at the pictures. Look at them. You see the dark rectangle, but like a doorway, like an aperture. Yes, and it's also a gaping mouth letting out a silent howl of feral, foul, primal, real, not nice, not fine, real, a moon of lapture, something divine and damned, something immortal, not comic books, not soup cans, something behind me and above me. Whatever it is, it's not pretty, it's not fine. I am here to stop your heart. You understand? I am here to make you think. I am not here to make pretty pictures. I wish I had the capacity for such powerful language. I don't know if furniture, or whatever we call it, can ever have the power of a painting but I would like to think it possible. I certainly don't want my work to be thought of as pretty, beautiful, or nice. In fact, there should be a dark side, a questioning side, and most of all, it must make the viewer think. 
I question everything I do. I make no assumptions. I take nothing for granted. I fully embrace ambiguity. Nothing good is easy. And that's because we see so little at first glance. It's only after really thinking about something that we are able to move ourselves into perceptions that we never knew we were capable of. Think until you can think no more. Think until the necessary thoughts intersect. I believe it is important to make work that is collectible. A work is not going to be collectible or truly collectible if the design was influenced by the original client. By collectible, I mean taking into consideration that wherever a work goes, it's not likely to stay. People move, people get divorced, they die. At some point, the house or the business will be sold. Will it look attractive on the second market? Will Sotheby's want to sell it? This is how a work gains provenance. I want to give value to those who collect my work. I don't believe anyone should buy an, a work for investment. Buy it because you love it, and you will be its caretaker for a while. Don't pay attention to the market. I don't make what someone wants. I make what I feel is the right thing to do. It's the only way to move forward. No one, no one would ask me to make what I make. That's my responsibility. As an artist, it means I must always be taking a risk. My studio joined the digital age about nine years ago. First was scanning. I still do all of my idea sketching with pencil on paper. Designing on the computer is not for me. A computer has a mind of its own. It wants to fix what it perceives as a mistake, such as smoothing out a blip in a line. Computer designs look like computer designs. I want the blips and inconsistencies to remain. My solution is to make scale models, which we scan, and then they enter the computer, inconsistencies and all. This is a terrific help, as the computer-generated patterns are very accurate. It soon became very clear that we needed a CNC machine of some sort. After a good deal of research, we decided on a six-axis ABB 6400 robot with very large capacity, and we are now in the process of adding a seventh axis. It's been a fantastic way, then more than I can mention. We are able to do things that are impossible with normal woodworking equipment. Now, some may think this is just not right. What happened to the handwork? What happened to being handmade? Well, at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, we heard the same argument about power equipment like band saws and table saws. I love, I love the robot and it's been a fabulous addition to our studio. And we affectionately refer to it as Mr. Chips. Uh, anyone interested in, in knowing more about uh, robotics, uh, there is a book out entitled Wendell Castle Remastered, and you can get it from Amazon or many bookstores. As I pointed out earlier, Random events have greatly affected my life. Here are three random events that significantly impacted my way of working. 
when I was 12 or 13 years old, uh, my father subscribed to a magazine called Delta Craft, which, as you might expect, is a how-to-do-it magazine. Each month, they would show articles about how to build something. I remember only one article, and that was how to build a duck decoy. The duck was laminated out of three-quarter inch pine to cross sections that the magazine provided. After rasping off the stair steps, you had a duck. Uh, sadly, I never made a duck. Random event number two. At that time, I never suspected that I had any artistic talent. My grade school, middle school, high school had no art programs. I had no idea what I might become. And frankly, as I mentioned, I wasn't good at anything. The first semester of my sophomore year in college, I had the opportunity to take an elective. I took art. It changed my life. It saved my life. For the first time, I was the best student in the class. The teacher, Dr. Simone, took me aside and advised me that I should leave this college and go to a school that had a great art program. I did. Random event number three. As an art student, I would, of course, read the latest magazines. One article caught my eye, an article on Leonard Baskin, a uh, sculptor and woodcut artist that was quite popular in the 60s. The article explained how Leonard Baskin went about doing his sculptures. He carved large figures. He would go to a millwork house and have them glue up a giant block of wood, something in the order of 36 by 36 by 80. And then he would proceed to carve a figure. This was common practice. I thought, if only Leonard had read the article about the duck, <laughs> he could have saved an enormous amount of wood and an enormous amount of time. I decided that this is the way I would work. And I did. What's important about random events, and particularly when you connect them, is what you do about it. I told this story to an interviewer recently, and the interviewer suggests another point about the duck decoy. He focused on the word decoy and what that might mean in connection to my work. And there is a connection. A decoy is something, is something that it seems to be but is not. I very much like that idea about my work, at least at first glance. My work may look like sculpture, but it's not. It's furniture. There are other misleading points about the construction and content, which makes it quite ambiguous. The word duck actually has two meanings, as in this old joke. The first guy goes into the bar, second guy ducks. <laughs> Working memory is an essential tool of imagination. Sometimes all we need to do is pay attention to think until the necessary thoughts intersect. The process is slow, but the answer or insight will gradually reveal itself. As Nietzsche observed in his 1879 book, Human, All Too Human, quote, artists have a vested interest in believing in a flash of revelation. The so-called inspiration, shining down from heaven as a ray of grace. In reality, 
the imagination of a good artist or thinker produces continually good, mediocre, or bad ideas. His judgment, trained and sharpened to a fine point, rejects, selects, connects. All great artists and thinkers are great workers, tireless not only in inventing, but also in rejecting, shifting, transforming, ordering. No one, no one accomplishes anything of importance without the help of others. Not rock stars, not geniuses, or movie stars. Many, many have given me a leg up, starting with my parents, my professors, my staff, my dealers in New York City, in London and Paris, and of course my wife, Nancy Jurors. A random event, my discovering art, gave my life purpose. I'm blessed to have the three things that make work meaningful and satisfying. Autonomy, complexity, and the connection between effort and reward. And I'm not talking about money. It's, what, it's whether the work fulfills us. I believe that the best way to move forward is to study our thought processes and be willing to take a leap of faith. I have a tradition of ending my remarks with what I refer to as my rules adopted, my adopted rules of thumb. I would like to share 14 of them with you this morning. Number one, if you are in love with an idea, you are own no judge of its beauty or value. Number two, the dog that stays on the po porch will find no bones. Number three, if it's offbeat or surprising, it's probably useful. Number four, distrust what comes easily. Number five, there are three kinds of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. Number six, always listen to the voice of eccentricity. Number seven, if your mind is not baffled, your mind is not fully employed. Number eight, if you don't make mistakes, you are not working on a hard enough problem, and that's a mistake. Number nine, bring conflicting ideas to bear upon the same idea. Number 10, Celebrate uncertainty. Number 11, when you are through changing, you are through. Number 12, don't weigh things with your finger on the scale. Number 13, you miss 100% of the shots that you do not take. And that, that one reminds me of a a story I read recently about a, a small Midwestern newspaper whose obituary writer was out sick, so they asked the sports writer to fill in. And here's a, an obituary he wrote. Here lies, the jo here lies the bones of Nancy Jones, whose life held no terrors. She lived an old maid. She died an old maid. No hits, no runs. No errors. <laughs> and last, and, and last, and, and this is the most important one. If you hit the bullseye every time, the target is too near. Thank you.
think I have a few minutes for questions. If there are any burning questions, I would spend a few minutes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It still didn't. Well, I have, I have, I have three. Uh, I, I I played the guitar and do folk music things, and I actually performed publicly for the first time ever a few weeks ago, <laughs> and, and I. Actually, I wanted to sing a song today, but it was too hard to bring a guitar. Uh, uh, I, I collect uh, antique sports cars, and I'm an avid tennis player. But I would say the music is my real hidden passion. Thank you very much. <laughs>